Hello world, I'm Nick, and in this video I'm going to be talking about attributes in .NET, what they are, how you can use them, and how you can write your own custom attributes to make your code more descriptive. I make a lot of content about .NET and software development in general, what it's like to be a software developer, specialising in C Sharp, the .NET Framework or .NET Core, .NET in general, and the content's aimed at junior developers, senior developers, tech leaders, anyone working in the technology space. So if any of that interests you, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. So what are attributes? Well, attributes are a means of decorating your code with metadata. So we see these quite a lot in C Sharp. We tend to see them in square brackets above classes, above methods. Most things can have an attribute of some sort. The benefit of this is that you can be very descriptive about the code you're writing. So you may have a section of code which needs to be flagged with a specific description or attribute. It might be a piece of code which should or should not be serialized or should be ignored for the purposes of unit testing. And using something like an attribute with a piece of text or a label inside the square brackets allows you to label and describe your code effectively. So let's look at a very basic example of a fairly classic attribute that's used when working with JSON serializers. So I'm here in my console app and I'm going to use the example of a JSON attribute in a new class. So I'm going to go over to my project. I'm going to create a new class. I'm just going to call it my class. And then inside here, I'm going to create a simple property. So public string my property. What I can do here is add an attribute to say that there is a different preference for this property when certain things are happening. So in this case, I want to do it around JSON serialization. So I'm going to add a reference to system.text.json at the top. I'm going to zoom that in a bit. And then what I want to say is the hypothetical scenario where the system.text.json was serializing my class. If I wanted my property to be ignored by the serializer, I can add an attribute above the string property like so. So I can add some square brackets and then the attribute goes inside this. So the specific attribute that I want to add is JSON ignore. And as you can see from the guide here, it says it prevents a property from being serialized or deserialized. So having that on there means that when a serializer comes to serialize or deserialize my class, my property will be ignored. Very useful if you've got extra metadata or extra data in general on a class that is commonly serialized or deserialized and you want that to be ignored. So in terms of what attributes are and how they're used, it really is as simple as that. Any library or namespace within .NET will have a set of attributes at some point that, you, that will be available to you so that you can decorate your code and label it as needed. Some attributes also take values and parameters because at the end of the day, an attribute is simply a class. So I could actually use some attributes which receive arguments that dictate how that attribute affects the code. So another example of an attribute which would take arguments would be allowed values. So this is part of data annotations. It's a very common part of .NET when it comes to attributes. And this takes some arguments. If I put a set of parentheses after this, you can see that the attribute is expecting me to pass in some arguments. Now this is expecting an array of objects, but I'm just gonna pass in one, uh, which is a string. So it's only allowed to be called hello. Uh, and then optionally I can put uh, an error message as well. So I could say, uh, you were supposed to say hello. It's a very bizarre use case, but it illustrates the, the point. So I'm not going to go further than those, but you can see here we've got an attribute with parentheses after it, which allows us to then pass in parameters. So that means that you could then evaluate that attribute and it would tell you whether you were compliant and whether you had actually added the value you were supposed to. So now I want to create my own custom attribute because I want to be able to add specific metadata to my code. And this is really straightforward to do. So what I've done here is I've created a new class called Nick Custom. So this is the name of the attribute, basically. And in order to turn this class into an attribute, we simply inherit 
the attribute class. So this is just from system.attribute. It comes from .NET. We inherit it. And from here, that means we're able to use this as an attribute. So if I go back into my class and I just want to add some example functionality, what I could do is add a constructor. So I could say my class, and then I could say string my property, and then my property equals whatever I pass in. Then I can make that a get only. I'll create a private field. So my property value equals an empty string would help if I put the actual data type in there. And then I'll change this so that it is equal to the value of my property value. And then I'll change this again to my property value equals that. So I'm this example, I'm setting a private field, and then I've got a property which will return that if anything else outside of that scope calls into it. Now what I can do in here is I can say that this property has an attribute, and it is Nick custom. So because I've created that class that inherits attribute, I'm able to use that as an attribute pretty much anywhere I want. Now on the topic of using it wherever I want, you may not want the developer to do that. So you may want to be very granular and specify that the developer can actually only use it on a method or a property or a class. So in order to restrict the usage of an attribute, we can use the attribute usage attribute. It's an attribute for governing how attributes work. Inception. So above the actual class, we can put an attribute. And we can start this off by saying that it's an attribute usage. And this also receives a set of parameters. So I can set the attribute targets to whatever targets I will allow. So if I say this can only be used on a property, then it should prevent me from using this Nick custom attribute on, say, a class or a method. So it's already fine to be on this property. But if I try to put it on this class, then I'll get a red squiggle. It will not allow me to compile this because it says that attribute Nick custom is not valid on this declaration type. It is only valid on property indexer declarations. So you can be very specific about how you want the attribute to be used, where you want it to be used. And there are lots of other things that you can can restrict as well. So I can say whether or not the use of multiple of the same attributes is allowed. So if I set that to uh, false, now I've got a constraint that says that the attribute can only be used on a property and you can only use it once. It's a very specific constraint. So let's talk about constructors and how we can send parameters through to our custom attributes. And then that should allow me to use two instances of Nick custom that are slightly different. So back on the Nick custom attribute, it's as simple as adding a constructor as you would as part of a class, because again, attributes are just classes. So public Nick custom, and then I can say it accepts a string called name. And then I might have a property up here, read only string name. And we're just setting that set to name. There we go. So now if I also add a blank constructor, that also allows me to use the attribute without parameters. And so now that I've got that constructor, I can also pass in Tim. So that will allow me to put a name property in, for example. So it gives us a little bit more versatility to extend the functionality of attributes. But why would we want to add data or dynamic data to attributes specifically? Well, it might be because you want to be able to check if a certain element has an attribute. And if so, what does the data inside that attribute say? because that might inform how your code operates in just the same way that using JSON ignore would tell the serializer to ignore a property or other element with that attribute. You can in your custom attribute say, if a piece of code has this attribute or this attribute with a certain value, then take a different action. So I'll show you an example of this, but we have to be quite careful in production. This could affect your performance a little bit under the hood reflection will be used which allows .NET to look at itself. It allows it to look at its own code at runtime, which is fine. And it's a very well optimized system, especially in later versions of .NET. But there's no escaping that reflection when used heavily can increase overhead. So just be aware of that if you do put this into practice. So let's just go and change our 
custom attribute. So I'm going to say that it has to be used on a class. So now that will break this attribute, or it should do when it catches up. There we go. And I'm going to take this attribute and pop it on top of the class. And I'm going to keep the name property set to Tim. It's just a name that I've chosen. And then in program, so I have to pass in a property for this. I'll just pass in some arbitrary data. What I'm going to do is create a method which will inspect the attribute that is on my class. So I can create a void method called check my class attribute. Then I can create an instance of the attribute that I'm looking for. So I can say nick custom custom attribute equals tribute dot get custom attribute. So this is a static function where we can pass in the element that we say could have the attribute and the type of attribute that we're looking for. So for this, we're looking for type of my class. So that's the element that we're saying has the attribute. The class has the custom attribute and the type of attribute is Nick custom. Now that on its own won't work because attribute.getCustomAttribute won't implicitly convert the result to the type that you're targeting. So you have to cast it to the attribute type that you're looking for. So I'll cast it to type Nick custom and there you go. So custom attribute should then be returned as a Nick custom attribute. Then what you can do is a null check on that. So if the attribute wasn't found on that class, then it will return null. So if custom attribute not equals null, then we'll inspect the context, the contents. So we could say um, console dot right line and then custom attribute. And because we've casted the result to a type of Nick custom, we can access its properties. So then you could do things like, okay, if custom attribute dot name equals Tim, then, you know, do something different. So this is essentially reconstructing that example of the JSON serialization attribute, where we were saying, if it's got that attribute, then ignore it for the purposes of serialization. We're pretty much constructing the same kind of thing in the same manner using custom attributes. So then just for the purposes of my console app, let's just call this check my class attribute method. And then I'll put a console.read line at the bottom. And we'll step into it. So you can see it's not null because we've got something back and there's our attribute. So we can write that out to the console and you can see there's the value. So if you're looking for a way to manage the way different pieces of code look at other pieces of code, attributes are a good way forward. You can decorate elements such as classes, properties, methods with differentiators, things that label those elements as requiring further attention. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please don't hesitate to leave a like. And I hope you'll join me again soon for some more content around .NET and software development. See ya.